Good morning. It's good to welcome you here. It's good to hear God's people fellowshipping, and, uh, and we're just glad that you're here this morning. We're looking forward to what God has to teach us, what God has to tell us, and how he is going to prepare us to go out and to serve him this week. That's what it's all about, right, is to serve him with, uh, uh, with all of our power, all of our might, with all the urgency that the love of Jesus Christ requires us to do. And that's what we want to do and be about this morning. Let's prepare our hearts to get our marching orders and do what the Lord wants us to do this morning. Right. Uh, we're so glad to have the Greer family that's going to help. I mean, I'm sorry, the Hutton family that's going to help us this morning to light our Advent candles. So let's welcome them as they come help. Savior would be born, a king in the line of David. Isaiah wrote, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. When Jesus came, he taught people the importance of being peacemakers. He said that those who make peace shall be called the children of God. We light the candle of peace to remind us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace and that through him peace is found. Peace is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at this candle, we celebrate the peace we found in Jesus Christ. I would like you to officially go on record that this was one Sunday that Andy had his bulletin and knew his place. Um, sometimes that doesn't exactly happen. I, I know. Uh, we just want to say welcome. So glad you're here to worship with us today. Have a few announcements I just want to cover. Before I get into the announcements, I just wanted to mention these flowers at the altar up front are here in honor of Jim and Mary Jane Harris and their 60th wedding anniversary. That's a big deal. He's actually not doing very well, but I know some of their families here with us this morning, so I just wanted to mention that. Uh, in the way of announcements for the things we have going on in the life of the church, I saw a tree this morning outside the nursery. I want to tell you about it. There's a Christmas tree with all these cards on it. I wasn't really sure what it was, but Connor, our children's minister, explained it. It's a blessing tree. So if you're looking for a way to try to do something for somebody over this holiday, there's actually cards all over this tree that you can go by and just grab a card, and in that card, it's going to give you an idea of something that you you could do for someone just to bless them over this holiday season. I told him I thought that was a, a great idea, so that I would share that with you. Tonight, we have our Christmas at Oak Island event uh, from 5 to 7. 
Charles is going to leave here with the bus if you need a ride on the bus at 445 if you'd like to ride out there or you can just go straight out to the barn at Oak Island and that'll be from 5 to 7. Tons of activities going on. It's a great time of fellowship and we're just going to say the rain's going to stay away. It's going to be a great day. Uh, we also have dinner theater tickets still on sale. Our dinner theater starts this coming Friday. I was asked to remind you if you come to dinner theater, not only do you need a ticket, you need two canned good items that are actually going to eventually be donated to the Baptist Association, but they're part of what we're doing during the dinner theater. So we want to encourage you to bring those as part of a canned food drive that we're doing over the holiday season. Uh, if you would, let's bow and just have a time of prayer together as we begin our service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this morning to worship together, to hear your name spoken, Father, to see what Jesus has done for us and on the faces of each of the people in this room. Father, as we enter into December and into this holiday season, we are so thankful for what you've done for us through Jesus Christ. And I pray that he will truly be the heart of this season. And as we celebrate the Christmas season together as a church, Father, I pray that your kingdom would be advanced, that we would take the message of the hope we have through the birth of life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let us be empowered by that message and be a light in this community. We ask that in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. We're so glad you're here. We want to continue our worship. Will you stand with me as we continue and join us on the carol this morning. Oh, come, all ye faithful.
pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you so much that we can call on the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who loved us, Father, even though, Father, we didn't deserve the love that he bestowed on us. This morning, Father, we ask that you just continue to speak to our hearts. Draw us near. Help us to understand the love. And, Father, help us to worship him as he deserves to be worshipped for what he did for us at Calvary. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Well, thank you, choir, for such a powerful anthem this morning. We appreciate it very much. Now, it's good to see you all here on this uh, beautiful, nice, pleasant Sunday morning. Um, I know what some of you are thinking because I know you guys pretty well. And some of you are looking at this outline and you've counted 20 different fill in the blanks this morning. <clears throat> and you're thinking, wow, we're going to be here until tomorrow. <laughs> and I just want to reassure you that is not true. We will be done by nightfall at the latest. <laughs> Seriously, the message is pretty simple and straightforward. We're going to move through this pretty quickly this morning. So kind of buckle your seat belts and here we go. We're talking about living with the end in sight. Um, look at our key verse there from 1 Peter 4, verse 7. Let's read this short verse together aloud. Would you join me? The end of all things is near. The end of all things is near. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Uh, Peter's not the only one to mention that. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 4 or 5, the Lord is near. And John in Revelation 22 said the time is near. So this is a prevalent theme in the New Testament. According to the Bible, there are several important facts about the last days that every believer and non-believer needs to know. First, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is coming again in bodily form to the earth. Not only that, when he comes, he will judge all people. And he will set up an eternal kingdom that we call heaven to gather together those who have trusted him for salvation to live with him eternally. And those who have not trusted Christ will be forever separated from God and his people in the place we call hell. His coming is imminent. He may come at any time. In fact, Jesus said that he will come like a thief in the night. When people least expect it, that's when he will come. Now, I don't know about you, but my assessment is that not very many people in our world today are seriously looking for the return of Jesus Christ. Not many. Which means that he could come at any moment. Therefore, we need to live with the end in sight and be prepared for that day when it comes. Now, personal growth experts tell us that one way to live with a sense of purpose and urgency is to begin with the end in mind. In other words, imagine yourself at your own funeral service and ask, what do I want others to say about me when my time on this earth is over? How do I want to be remembered? What do I really want to accomplish in this life? Think of that and live your life accordingly. Well, that's not bad advice. One issue that we face, however, is that we don't know how long that we have. None of us is promised tomorrow. And that uncertainty for the believer is further emphasized by the fact that Christ could return suddenly before we pass from this earth. So, if the end of all things is near and Christ could return at any moment, then how do we know that we are ready for that day? Well, Peter gives us several steps that we can take in order to prepare for the end of this world as we know it. Four steps, very quickly. Number one, put the past behind you. If you want to be ready for that day, you need to put the past behind you. Notice what Peter says there in verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles. These are unbelievers, the Gentiles. Having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries... In all of this, they are surprised that you do not run with them in the same excesses of dissipation and they malign you. Now Peter here is talking about putting the past behind you. Uh, there, there are two ways of doing this. 
One way is to stop doing the things that you did in the past and to live a new kind of life pleasing to God. And the other way is to emotionally and spiritually separate yourselves from the things that you have done in the past. Well, to keep the past in the past, in other words. So I would say that one as, is as important as the other. How do you do that? Peter says you need to do three things if you really want to put the past behind you. Look at your outline. He says, first of all, stop living for pleasure. Stop living for pleasure. <clears throat> now, we've talked about this a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> pleasure is really a byproduct of living for Christ. So if you want more joy, you want more pleasure in your life, then walk with Christ. Stay in fellowship with Him. And pleasure and a sense of joy will come to you as a byproduct of that relationship. So it's not to be the goal of life. If you love God and serve Him faithfully, you'll have all the pleasure in the world. God says, I will give you the desires of your heart. But if you make pleasure your one and only goal in life, then it will always be fleeting. People today don't understand this. They're, they're constantly searching and reaching for pleasure. What will make me happy? What will give me a few moments of pleasure? And they think, well, if I can just drink... Get drunk. Then I can forget my troubles for a little while and be happy. Or if I can just involve myself in a sensual relationship with another person, then I'll be happy. Or if I can just party and carouse and you know, be with other desperate people like myself, then maybe I'll be happy. And that works for a little while, but then it doesn't last. And it's nothing new. Peter mentions that these people have been pursuing a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties. It's all about living for pleasure, living for the purpose of making yourself feel good. And it's one of the most effective tools of the evil one. So in our pleasure, often he causes us to forget God. So Stop living for pleasure. In other words, it's not wrong to have pleasure. Just don't make it your goal in life. It becomes a byproduct of your relationship with the Lord. He also says, get rid of idols. Get rid of idols. If you want to be ready for the last day, Peter mentions abominable idolatries. An idol is anything that takes the place of God. You say, well, we don't have that kind of stuff today. Right? Wrong. There are countless idols in America today. Success, money, achievement, entertainment, sex, food, on and on and on we could go. So get rid of the idols in your life that are coming between you and God. And then he says, be careful who you run with. Be careful who you run with. He says their old friends are surprised that you don't run with them anymore. There's an old saying that you'll never fly with the eagles if you run with the turkeys, right? So you got to be careful who you spend time with. Birds of a feather flock together, and you will become like the people that you spend the most time with. It's inevitable and unavoidable. It's human nature. So if you're trying to kick a drug habit, can you hang around with people who are taking drugs? Not if you want to stay clean very long. It's the same thing with any sin that you're trying to overcome. Drugs, alcohol, illicit sex, porn, gossip, a negative attitude, overeating. So be careful who you spend most of your time with. You've heard it said before that you can only live in the present. And you cannot live in the past. And you can't live in the future. But you can allow worries about the future and regrets about the past ruin your present. And that's what a lot of people do. So put the past behind you. Christ has already paid for all of your sins so you can move on and face the future guilt-free. That's what he offers us. Christ has secured your past, your present, and your future on the cross. And that leads us to our next point. If we are to live with the end in sight, 
We need to put the past behind us. And then secondly, we need to prepare for the coming judgment. Peter says in verse 5, they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. We need to live in light of eternity. Take the long view of life. Most people only live for the here and now. Most people only look at what's, what's immediately in front of them. Those who live for pleasure, those who live for idols, those who run with a party crowd, they're not thinking long term. <coughs> they're not thinking about, well, I want to be ready when the Lord comes. Living in light of eternity means living your life with a view of God's eternal plan, including judgment. Paul said, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This life is only a prelude to life after death. If you live to be 100 years old on this earth, that's less than a blink of an eye compared to eternity. If you're a believer, you're going to spend much more time on the other side of death than you are on this side. So don't waste what little time you have living for things that are not going to last. Living a lot of eternity means living in preparation for judgment day. Peter takes the stance that a view of the coming judgment is actually healthy for one's faithfulness. That's not true out in the world, is it? Nothing could be more unpopular. Just ask the average guy on the street. He don't want to talk about the end of all things and the day of judgment. No one wants to think about it because no one wants to think that there are any consequences for their actions. Nobody wants to be held accountable for their behavior. So the idea of, of a judgment day for the unbeliever is just laughable. They don't want to believe that and they certainly don't want to talk about it. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the idea of a day of judgment can actually be a comfort to you. It's like when you were in school. Some of you can remember when you were in school, right? Way back when. I know it's hard for some of us, but just think about when you were back in school and you knew that a, a major exam was coming up. And if you were prepared for that test, you didn't have to dread it, right? You didn't have to sweat it. You were ready. You knew the answers. You did well. It was just a proving day for you that you were prepared. But if you don't study and you're not prepared, then it's a day to dread. It's the same thing with the day of judgment. Those of us who are living for Christ, those of you that are in fellowship with him, that are living in obedience to him, that's going to be a great day because it's a day when all the world will know that you put your faithfulness in your Lord and Savior. So, what can you do to be prepared? Let me just, I'm going to move very quickly through these, these blanks here, okay? First, receive God's forgiveness. In Christ, we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sin. So, that's where it starts, right? You've got to receive God's forgiveness and then resolve to live for Christ. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So you need to receive his forgiveness, resolve to live for him, and then remove barriers to your spiritual growth. Get rid of the things that hinder your walk with Christ. And then rely on God's strength. Paul said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now here's the good news that a lot of people miss. Once you become a follower of Christ... He gives you the equipment and he gives you the power to live for him. You're not on your own. You don't, you're not in it by yourself. He is with you. Rely on his strength and then refuse to give up. Refuse to give up because when you receive Christ into your life, you're immediately you, under attack, right? The evil one comes after you and that continues throughout our days on this earth. Refuse to give up. One of my favorite verses is, when Paul said in Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in well-doing for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. And then finally, respond to opportunities with a sense of urgency. Respond with a sense of urgency. Paul said, be careful how you walk, making the most of your time because the days are evil. I think that's more true today than ever before. Urgent times call for an attitude of urgency. Today's the day. 
Today is the day to obey. <clears throat> so, do it. Obey him. Don't put off till tomorrow what you can do for God's kingdom today. Don't procrastinate. Don't hesitate. Participate in God's program. Ask yourself, what have I been putting off? What, what is it that I know God wants me to do that I haven't done yet? Go and do it. Respond with urgency. So be prepared for the day of judgment. And then thirdly, Peter says we need to pray and pray hard. Pray hard. Verse 7, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Prayer is one of the most under Utilize tools that God puts at our disposal. Jesus said, <clears throat> ask and you shall receive. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking and the door will be open. He commands us to persist in prayer. Pray hard and pray often. And yet we usually see prayer as a last result, right? How many times have you heard it? How many times have you even said it? You know, all we can do now is pray. We've tried everything else. Well, why not begin with prayer? You know, why not turn to God first and foremost when you have a need in your life? Paul said pray without ceasing. That means prayer is an ongoing conversation with the living God. We just keep the lines of communication open as we continue to pray to Him. Anybody can tell you, that the key to a healthy relationship is communication. That's true with your husband or wife. That's true with your friend. That's true with your boss. That's true in any relationship in life. And it's certainly true in our relationship with our Lord. So we need to be mindful of His nearness. And prayer helps us to do that. When we talk to God in prayer, it helps us to be aware that, hey, God is here. He's not out there somewhere. He's right here. We begin to see God in different circumstances and different things that are situations and things that are happening in our life. We, we see his presence and we feel his presence and it makes all the difference in the world. So pray hard. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. When we're walking in fellowship with him, we see him all around us. Therefore, pray first, pray hard, pray often, and don't stop praying. If you're going to be fully equipped and prepared and ready for the end of all things, you must pray. What do you need to pray for? Let me just mention these things briefly. Uh, one thing we need to pray for is we need to pray in order to praise you see, a lot of people have the mistaken notion that we just come on Sunday morning to praise God, right? We just praise God when the choir is singing a great hymn like they just did. Or we, we praise God when we're singing congregationally, but then we don't have to praise Him during the week. But that's not true. That's a part of what prayer is. Prayer is taking an opportunity to praise the Lord. And to worship Him. It's vitally important to begin your prayer time with praise and worship and adoration. We're to worship daily. And then pray for spiritual growth. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Pray that God will enable you to grow in His grace daily so that you become more spiritually mature. I suggest that you pray in the morning after you've read Scripture. And that gives you something specific to pray for. Pray for your spiritual growth. And then pray for your needs. Uh, Paul told us not to be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, present your request to God. Petition simply means a list of your needs, right? You bring that list of your needs and you say, God, I'm going to need you today. Got an important meeting coming up. I'm going to need your help. I got a big job coming up. Lord, I'm going to need you. I got to deal with a family situation. God, I need your grace. I need your strength. I need wisdom. I need you to guide me. Just relying upon Him day by day. And then finally, pray for others. Don't allow your prayers to become too selfish. Sure, we need to pray for our needs. That's part of what prayer is. But don't leave it there. Pray not only for yourself, but also for others. Pray for the unsaved who need to know Christ. Pray for other believers. Pray for 
missionaries on the front line sharing the gospel. Pray for spiritual leaders. Pray for me because I certainly need it. Pray for those in authority. Pray for the president. Pray first, pray hard, pray often, and keep on praying. And then finally, number four, Peter says if you really want to be ready for that day, you need to persist in love. Persist in love. Verse 8 says, above all, Keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. I like that word fervent. It's akin to the word zealous that we talked about last week. It's not a lukewarm kind of love that Peter's talking about. It's a, it's a deep, burning, heartfelt kind of love. That's what biblical love is. Godly love is not passive. It doesn't wait for the other person to come begging for help. It doesn't wait for the other person to ask for acceptance or forgiveness. Love takes the initiative and reaches out and stretches forth to another person to demonstrate God's love to them. That's what biblical love is. There there are at least three characteristics of this godly love. First, love is a choice, right? It's a choice. You choose to love someone or you choose not to love them. Paul said over all these virtues, put on love. Love is much more than a feeling. You can't command a feeling, but God commands us to love one another. And that's a choice that we make. We we choose to love someone and we choose not to love them. It's up to you. Paul says put on love. It's like putting on a, a coat on a cold day. Just wherever you go, go out with a heart full of love. Love. There are so many angry people in our society today. And you see them all the time in this workaday world. They're out on the highways. They may be next to you at work. It may be a member of your family, maybe a friend, maybe people at school. They're angry. And that's why there's so many tragedies in our news on a daily basis of school shootings and, uh, you know, crazy drivers who try to attack another person. I mean, it's, it's an angry world that we live in. And if you and I, as people of God, do not show the people of this world God's love, then who will? Who will? Love is a choice that you make every day. Love is also a conduct. It's a conduct. John says, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions. Love is not a warm, fuzzy feeling. It's doing what's best for the other person. So when you love someone, you're doing what's best for them. Love is sacrificial and unselfish and self-giving. Love is something you do. And finally, love is your mission. It's your mission in life as a follower of Christ. John said, let us love one another, for love is from God. If you're a follower of Christ, then love is who you are. It is your DNA. It's who you are because it's who God is. And if God is love and you're connected with Him through Christ, then you must love. It's it's your nature. It's your mission in life. You don't get to choose whether or not to love people. It's your mission to love them. Jesus said that you're to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that love that you extend to God comes flowing back to you in in overwhelming fashion so that the love in your heart overflows and touches those around you. If you love God, you will love others. And if you do not love others, it's a sign that maybe your relationship with God is not where it needs to be. It's impossible to love God and not love others. You might love others and not love God, but you can't love God and not love others. The more you love Him, the more you love the people made in His image. The more you love Him, the more you want to reach out and and stretch out a hand to those who don't know Him, to those who are hurting, to those who are sick, to those who are needy, to, to those who are lonely. And so... Love is what we're to be about. That's why Peter said, above all, above all else, keep fervent in your love. Love must be a priority 
It must be above all. And that's why this morning I'm begging you to, to do whatever you need to do to keep your love fervent, to keep it a, a priority. And the best way to do that is to just keep serving others. Serving is an expression of God's love. Love is an action. It's, it's doing for others. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 25, When you've done it unto one of the least of these, you have done it unto me. When you love others, you demonstrate your love, you show your love through your behavior, through your actions, then you're giving God's love to the world around you. We recently discovered a young family uh, here in Columbiana that uh, had a house that needed, desperately needed some repair work. And so I mentioned it to some of our deacons, and they got to, went over to the house one day. Mike led a group over there, and they said, you know, do you mind if we put a new roof on your house? And they said, That'd be great. Because I had little children. The roof was leaking coming down in the family. So some of our guys talked to some other guys and people started donating. People started giving plywood and roofing and, uh, and just so many people. You know God's in it when all of a sudden there's just more and more people that say, I want to help. I'll, I'll help. I'll do this. I'll do that. Some of our men went over there the other day and started working on that house and been working on it for the last three days. And hopefully by tomorrow, hopefully before the rain comes, they'll have a new roof on their house. That's love in action, right? That's love in action. And people can't help but be moved by that. That speaks louder than than just words alone, right? I read about a young mother who felt overwhelmed and she was battling depression. Her schedule and the demands on her life had become just overwhelming. She said, all I seemed to do was just nag at my family incessantly. And, and when I looked at myself, I didn't really like what I saw. And then she said, in my tears, I cried out to the Lord. And in my time alone with God... <clears throat> The answer came to me in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Five words leaped off the page at me. Without love, I am nothing. So she wrote those words on little signs all over her house to remind her. On the refrigerator, on the door, in the car. Wherever she went, she was reminded, without love, I'm nothing. And she said, I, I realized in, in, that the single most important thing I could do in my life was to love people. So I began to live my life by love. I began running my home on love. And it was as transforming to me, she said, as the day I accepted Jesus Christ into my life. It brought joy back to my life. It brought joy to my home and my family. You want to change somebody else? Just start loving them. Just love them sacrificially. You want to change your life? Start living a life of love. Have you learned the priority of love? Peter said the end of all things is near. Might be today, might be tomorrow, might be any time. We don't know that, but we need to be prepared. Are you ready? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Christ our Lord this morning. We ask you, Lord, to help us to learn to live with the end in sight. Help us to live in such a way that we would not be ashamed or embarrassed when our Lord comes for us. Help us to put the past behind us, to live for the one true God. Lord, help us to repent of our sins and to receive your grace and your forgiveness. Help us to resolve to live for our Lord and Savior. 
and to rely on the strength that he provides. Help us to live with a sense of urgency. And Lord, help us to make prayer a daily part of our lives, to praise you and to worship you on a daily basis, and to pray not only for our own needs, but for the needs of others. And Lord, above all, help us to persist in love, to make it our mission in life, to demonstrate God's wonderful, self-giving, self-sacrificing love to those around us. We ask it all in the holy name of Christ our Lord. And God's people said, Amen. We come now to uh, respond to what God has spoken to us this morning by our hymn of invitation. So as we stand and sing, we ask you to come as God speaks to you this morning. Now to worship our Lord through the giving of our tithes and offerings as our men come forward to receive our offering this morning. But the Dickie Porter is going to come and lead us in our prayer. We don't remember Mark and Annie Crosby who were serving the Lord in Central Asia along with all of our other missionaries that are out there sharing the, the love of God around the world. And I, again, I want to take this moment to remind you of our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. 100% of our Lottie Moon offering goes directly to support our international missionaries serving around the world. And uh, our goal this year, I think, is 20000 And that's a reachable goal for us. We've done that before. So keep that in mind and in your prayers as well. Dickie. Let us pray. Father, we love you. And we love that we can celebrate this time of year. Lord, we've just come through Thanksgiving, a time that lets us reflect on the the many blessings that you give us and as we prepare for the holy seasons father it, it's a time to remind us that you first loved us that you sent your only son to die for our sins and your word tells us lord that we're to love you and we're to love our neighbors and we can do that by giving back a portion of our possessions and our time and at this time of our service lord we ask that, that you bless these offerings the furtherance of your kingdom. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
always appreciate Miss Glinda. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's the Christmas season, have you noticed? And, uh, of course, our sanctuary is so beautiful, as always, and we appreciate all the volunteers that help make that happen. I want to remind you that tonight we have our Christmas at Oak Island event, which is basically we're going to meet in a big barn. We're going to have a bonfire outside, weather permitting, and just have lots of fun and games, good fellowship time for for families and, and young people and older people and children of, of all ages. So come and join us for that this evening. Then we got uh, our Christmas dinner theater coming up the following weekend. And then we have keyboards at Christmas. And I heard a rumor the other day that Rick Jones is going to make his musical debut at that <laughs> event. So that alone is worth a throng of people to just come and, and watch that happen. And so we're looking forward to that, Rick. Really are. Right? He's, he's practicing uh, every day to get ready for that. So we have just lots of wonderful things coming up. Uh, so please take advantage of these. I know some of you are going to be traveling, you know, from week to week in, in the next few weeks. But it's going to be a wonderful time of Christmas. And it begins right here in the place of worship where it should be, right? Let's stand for our closing prayer together. And as we stand and sing, Brother Tom Moore will lead us in our prayer. May we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time to thank you for your blessings of life. Thank you, Lord, that we could be assembled at this place, at this time, to worship you. May we never, God, take that blessing, that liberty for granted. Your word tells us that the only thing you require of us is to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. May we be found doing those things this coming week, Lord. May we love, may we walk humbly with you, realizing that you care about us and that every aspect of our life is important to you. May our life reflect that. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.